All right, all right. You know how I roll. You got to high five somebody. Let them know that you're happy that they're here. There we go. Look at all these high fives. Yes, yes. I actually got involved this week. This is just everybody. Yes, we're high fives all around. There we go. There we go. Got to leave you hanging, cat. There we go. Yes, yes. Great, great day. Uh, you go ahead and have a seat for a second because I know it's going to take me a minute to talk. But if I haven't got a chance to meet you, my name is Tyler West. And I get to serve as the pastor here at Divine Church. If there's any way that I can serve you or specifically pray for you, reach out to me at tyler.west at divine.tv or you can call me on my cell phone, 864-706-9634. So today, guys, we, we're on the countdown to Easter. I don't know if you know that. We've only got a few Sundays. Can you believe that? This year seems like it is flying by, but I can't believe that this time last year was actually Easter. You know, this is that holiday that changes just a little bit. So this time last year, we were celebrating Easter, getting ready for baptisms. And now this year, we've got two weeks till Easter, and we're going to be getting ready for baptism. So all of that to say, anything you want to know about our church, if it's your first time hanging out with us, watching online, or maybe you just got questions about me or anything at all about following Jesus or what that means, we would love to invite you to the garden. What we want to do at the garden is we're not going to bother you throughout the week. We're not going to come knocking on your door in the middle of the week. What we really want to do is get information in your hands so if we can serve you or pray for you in any way or if there's anything that we can do to help you or point you in the right direction we would love for you to have that in your hands so if you'll meet us after the service it's over to my right to your left and if you're watching online i want you to know we're waiting for you to come and hang out with us at the garden anytime too on a sunday we'll have a special gift for you and we would love 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 just to say hello and meet you also guys uh today I don't know how excited you are about this, but I'm really excited. I don't know. I get excited about this every time. But today is service number four for our Spur student ministry. God has been placing here at, at the Vine. We're so excited because here's the thing. We know at the Vine here that one of the things that we know Jesus has called us to in 2019 is to let Spartanburg know that we're here to stay. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is by investing in our family ministries. Because here's the thing that I know about our students. God created them to be something special. And God created them to do something that we can't even imagine that he wants to do through them. So we want to help them find out who Jesus is, but more importantly, find out who he created them to be. So we're excited each and every week that we get to celebrate this first student ministry. This is the last time I think we're meeting this month. I think this is spur number four because Easter will be coming up when we do it next. So celebrate that. If you have a student at 6th through 12th grade, I want you to know we have a ministry just for you. Come hang out with us anytime. Also, guys, each and every Thursday, uh, we do what's called our greenhouse gathering. Now, let me tell you what happens there. You come to my house, uh, we mess it up, we have a good time, we trash the neighborhood and have great fellowship, right? Like really, 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 we do. We have a good time, we hang out, we have fellowship, but we really, really, really find out what it means to be the church. We serve each other. More importantly, we dive into God's word and specifically what we're doing right now is Financial Peace University. Because here's the thing that we know. Most marriages that end in divorce are over fights with money. It's about money. Most of the time in our life, if we're struggling with anything because we're, in, we're, we're not a third world country, we're a first world country, probably has to do with money. I know where stress happens in my life, it has to do with money. So to get our life aligned correctly, we have to prioritize and steward our money well. Financial Peace University helps do that. So if you would like to be a part of Thursday Night Greenhouse Gathering, let us know. Email hello at divine.tv and we'll get the Facebook information to you. We'll get when we meet, how we meet, but more importantly, we want you to know we got a seat at the table for you. And last but not least, each and every week, guys, the thing that I love about our church, we're going to be talking about this even more today in the message, is giving. We believe in sowing at our church. We believe in giving to something greater than us. We believe that God has blessed us to be a blessing. And so at the Vine Church, we don't talk to you about a number. We don't talk to you about a percentage. It's not my job to, to compulsory make you give. What I want to do is just point you to Jesus and say, hey, Whatever Jesus is calling you to do or give today, he will make more with that dollar that you're, he's called you to give than you could ever do with a hundred of your own dollars. I promise you right now. So if he's calling you to give today, I want you to take part in it. And how you can do that is our give box at that back of the room after the service or the vine.tv slash give. And specifically what we're doing right now here at the Vine Church is our spring heart for the house offering. 
And it's the Carolina Pregnancy Center is who we're going to be supporting starting this Sunday all the way through May 5th, the first Sunday in May. And we're going to present an offering to them on Mother's Day. And what we're doing is after the service, uh, if you would like, uh, we're going to be taking up donations each and every week. We've got baby bottles for you to go out in the community, start a conversation. Because here's the thing that I know at the church. The church is about life, not death. The church is bringing life and light to a dying world. And what better way to show the world who Jesus is and celebrate life than a place that meets people right where they are and walks with them step by step, whatever season they're in, probably at one of the scariest, worst moments of their life they feel like. And the Carolina Pregnancy Center does that. They give hope, they point people to Jesus, but more importantly, they let others know wherever they are that there is a life that Jesus has a plan for that life and that they're not walking through this alone. So if you want to be a part of our spring heart for the house, you can give online or you can be a part of collecting uh, donations with us through the baby bottles that we have. After the service, you can let us know. We'll get those in your hands. And like I said, what better way to show the world that we are about life than celebrating life. Uh, go ahead, and if you will, I'm about to pray, and after we pray, you'll stand up, we'll continue worship, but I just want to say thank you for being here today. I know in the craziness of spring break and the hecticness of every, hecticness, whatever word that is, I, that's favor flavor thing, remember that a couple weeks ago, whatever it is, you could have chose anything to do and anywhere to be, but whether you're watching online in the middle of the week or you're watching live this morning on Sunday, we're so thankful you're here, so let us pray. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into your house and to lift your name high. Jesus, none of this is about us. All of this is for you. It's not about how passionate we are. It's not about how, how, how great the things we do, Jesus. It's all about you because without you, we are nothing. So Jesus, today, I pray that as we see this cross hanging, as we, as we worship your name and we seek you out, I pray that we would remember the first time that we saw you for who you are, the first time that we really gave our life to you, the first time that, that we knew that in you there was hope, that we knew in you there was freedom, that we knew that only found in you would be the thing that could quench the thirst that this world could not ever satisfy. So today, bring us back to that moment. Today, let us worship you like the first time. Let us know that the best is still yet to come. And Jesus, we just pray that we make your name more famous. We love you, Lord. It's your wonderful and your precious name we pray. Amen. Savior 
Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for this um, awesome worship that we're having, and it's hot, God, <laughs> but um, we're going to make it through it. Um, just I want to pray over the service, I want to pray over Tyler, and I want to pray over what's going to happen in the spur, God. In your name we pray. Fist bump somebody and let them know this is going to be their best week ever. Now fist bump somebody else and let them know that. We got to let everybody know. We got to let everybody know that it's going to be a great, great week uh, as we get to go on. And I just want to take a moment before we even dive into what we're talking about uh, today. And I'm so thankful that the Spurs Student Ministry just headed out to their service. That's so awesome. God is so faithful. And I know he's not going to see this, but thank you, Alex, for coming on a short notice Last week, our teaching pastor of Hope Rising Ministries, bringing the preach, talking about our seven cries from the cross forsaken. As I'm walking through these health issues, I appreciate all the thoughts and prayers, but I know one thing. Jesus is alive, and today is going to be a great day because he has a word specifically for each and every one of us. And as I dive in, I just want to take a moment. Hey, maybe you're new to Spartanburg. Maybe, maybe you're walking through something with your family and you're searching for answers you can't find out in the world. Or, or maybe today, maybe you're in a place where you just feel like you're all alone. I want to extend an invitation to you. I know you're watching online, but I want to extend an invitation to you to come be a part of our family here. We have chairs for you. We have people who are dedicated each and every week to setting up a gym and creating a space where you can experience family and fellowship like never before. So I just want to tell you, if you're searching for some place to go, you might be able to find it right here because I promise you one thing. We're going to show you that it's not about us and that it's all about Jesus. So I just want to extend that invitation from the beginning today as we get to dive into this thing that we've been talking about over these past few weeks. And this thing is called the seven cries from the cross. Uh, we started off talking about being forgiven. We, we walked through, I don't know if you remember, we talked about the fog, the favor of God, and how we can live in a life with the favor of God. And, and we talked about how in the world we can have a life with Family, how Jesus talked about his mother and, uh, and John standing at the cross and how they were going to be together. And last week, Alex got to dive in to this thing called forsaken. Forsaken. So I'm excited that we get to continue going from this thing called forsaken to talking about what we're going to talk about today called fulfilled. Fulfilled. It's a cool word. It's a word I misspelled multiple times. So we're talking about fulfillment and being fulfilled. And I misspelled it many, many times because I wanted to leave that L out. So just hang in here with me as you're following along. And you'll see what I'm talking about because I believe today you're going to see something you may not have ever seen before. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in John 19 to begin with. But then we're going to camp out in Exodus 17. And here's the thing. Maybe you need a Bible. We have one free for the asking at the back. Bump your neighbor and let them know, hey. Let me have a Bible. We'll be glad to give you one. Also, one cool thing that we do each and every week is in this digital world, you may read your Bible digitally. So because of that, we create an event on the Bible app each and every week where you can follow along with us, take your own notes. But more importantly, once again, you can have a way to contact us if we can serve you or specifically pray for you in any way. And I'm going to show you really quick how you can do that. So if you download the Bible app from your favorite app store, what you're going to do is open that up. And then you're going to click on the more tab. And once you click on more, you're going to click on the events tab. 
Once you click on the events tab, you're going to see the Vine TV worship experience. Today, you're going to see seven cries from the cross fulfillment. And when you see that, click on that. You're going to find out all of our contact information. You're going to find out about Thursday night greenhouse gathering. You're going to find ways that we can serve and pray for you. But more importantly, you're going to find the scriptures that we're going to walk through today. So if you want to go ahead and get that, we're going to be in John 19. Once again, you know this is my favorite gospel, John, the gospel of John. We're going to be in John 19 and continue with his seven cries from the cross. And the next thing that Jesus talked about in the seven cries from the cross. So we're going to be in John 19 and verse 28 John 19 and verse 28 and it says this later knowing that everything had now been finished we're going to talk about finished next week when we take communion together which by the way will be an awesome service we're going to celebrate communion and and have Passover next week and talk about the finished part of this but it says later knowing everything had now been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled Jesus said I am thirsty. Have you ever just been thirsty? Like really thirsty. Like we live in the first world. And so like for us, if we're thirsty, like by God's grace, I get to carry a little water bottle on stage with me. Uh, and, and, and I get to go to the sink or I get to go to the, the faucet and, and get some water. But even just a hundred years ago where we are here in South Carolina, people didn't really have indoor plumbing. You had to go to the well. In third world countries, they walk miles and miles and miles just to get a a bucket of water. How blessed are we that God lets us live in a country where we could just turn on the faucet or go go drink hose water in the summer, if you know what I mean. You go outside and do that as a kid. We always had that, right? But I started thinking about, like, have you ever just been at a moment in your life where you can say, I am thirsty? The easy answer for me is I was thinking... Back in sports world where like you would be out in practice and you'd be hot and sweaty and just, man, 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 you'd need some water. And I said, well, man, that's not going to connect with everybody. So let me ask you this. When I thought about a time that I was really thirsty, I'm talking tongue stick to your mouth thirsty. How many of us have ever been to a theme park? Like Six Flags, Carowinds, Disney World. Have you ever thought there's a reason they charge $8 for a bottle of water? It's because they know that you're thirsty. They know that in that moment you've got kids who are thirsty Kids who will drink half the bottle and leave it on the ride somewhere, and then you got to go get them another one, and like things like that. Like they know that you are thirsty. And I started thinking about as a human being, there are times in our life where we're thirsty, right? So I'm looking at Jesus on the cross and how I've always grown up with this, and how this has always been taught to me. And we're not going to talk about it that way. We're going to talk about it a different way today. So hang in here with me. As we, I've always been taught we finally see Jesus' humanity in this. We see that he's fully man. We see that he's saying, I'm thirsty. We see the man in him. And he's just asking for something to drink. But what if Jesus was being more intentional? What if it wasn't about what he needed, but what he was trying to give us in that moment? Because here's the thing that I want you to know today. So many of us can look at our life and we see Jesus on the cross and say, man, I'm thirsty. And sometimes we can just think of the physical need of being thirsty, but it started making me think there are areas in our life that are just dry deserts that we're thirsty in. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's relationship. Maybe kids are going off to college. Maybe it's, it's something along the lines of somewhere in our life we're looking for Jesus to move and it's just dry. And we're trying to really work it out. We're trying to quench the thirst. The thirst would be the satisfaction that I'm no longer in a dry land, like I'm no longer in this dry place, that I'm thirsty for something more. I'm thirsty for something new. I, I want to live this life that's fulfilled. I want this thing to get past me. I want to have maybe some surgery for medical issues or something like we're thirsty and we're trying to get through it and so we see this moment in Jesus's time on the cross and we think man Jesus knows what it feels like for me as a person to feel thirsty and I started asking myself how in the world do I quench my thirst how in the world do I quench my thirst because when Jesus says I'm thirsty to the crowd at the time he was actually telling them something completely different I've had some friends in my life that are Messianic Jews, and what they talk about is, and and this is the phrase that they've told me, and I always clung to this, and I thought that it was really cool, is 
as we were sitting down and just talking about things and just talking about what we believe and why we believe it. And a Messianic Jew is this. They, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they follow the customs of the Jewish tradition. And so they were saying, hey, man, here's the thing that you have to understand as a Protestant. Here's the thing that you have to understand uh, as, as a Christian and, and how you're not a Messianic Jew is you get the big picture, but you miss all the details. You miss all the details. You miss what Jesus is pointing to because, because the details are so important. And me as a Messianic Jew, I see all the details, and sometimes I miss the big picture. It's cool how the body works together where we can do things like that. And so in that lens and in that phrase today, that's what I want to point to you to is at the time when Jesus is saying this, Alex pointed out last week how uh, in the Psalms, was predicting Jesus being on the cross. As a matter of fact, if you ever want to go to Psalm 69, you can see this is Jesus on the cross as well. We're not going to walk through that, but it predicted that Jesus would say he was thirsty at the time. But what Jesus is saying when he looks to the Jewish nation and says, I am thirsty, they went to Exodus 17. Now to us, that doesn't mean much. To us, it's just like, okay, it's Old Testament. Something was going on. It's in Exodus. He's obviously talking about when they got out of Egypt. It must not mean that big of a deal. But actually to them, what he is doing is intentionally pointing them to say, I am thirsty. But he's really asking them, how do you quench your thirst? And so today, that's what I want to show you today is how if you want to live a fulfilled life, live a life that Jesus died to give us, a John 10, 10 life, where he talks about, hey, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Today, I want you to see how to do that is you really just need to answer the question, how do you quench your thirst? So let's get to Exodus 17, and, and I'm believing you're going to see something new today, and I want to show you that's really crazy. It's crazy how God weaves things together, and he has this tapestry that he's building, and, and we can't see it until we look back. So when you remember, Jesus said, I am thirsty on the cross, and let's go to Exodus 17. And it says this, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of what? Sin. Can you believe that? How crazy is that? So a million people leave from the desert of sin. They just left Egypt being in slavery and bondage. They cross the Red Sea on dry land. They're in the desert of sin. And where do they go when they finally leave the desert of sin? You're going to see the cross all in this. Traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded, they listened to Jesus and did what he said. And they camped at Rephidim, which means the place of rest. So when they finally left their desert of sin, this dry place where their thirst couldn't be quenched by anything but God and God alone, they go to the place of rest. And what's the first thing we see that they see when they get there? But there was no water for the people to drink. So just remember where Israel is at this time. We just talked about it. They've gone through getting set free from Egypt. They've walked, through, they, they've walked all the way through the Passover feast they, they, they've left slavery and bondage and they're going and walking into God's promised land and they finally enter the place of rest and their lens is man you fed me manna for days you even gave me quail from the sky but I ain't got nothing to drink Lord remember what we talked about that kid the other week <laughs> had all the gifts and was mad because they would break and, and all manuals he had to read and the one had the horse manure in his room was looking for the pony I wonder in our life if that's kind of where we are right now. And I promise you as a Christian, I can say I've been right here where I'm supposed to be entering a place of rest, which I treat like a four-letter word. But instead, instead of resting, I just said I need more water to drink. So they quarreled with their leader Moses and said, give us water to drink because, you know, Moses was holding it all in his back pocket, like, I could feed all of you and give you all the water because Moses was just carrying it by himself, right? They get mad at Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water. They were in between rides. It was about 2 o'clock, and the asphalt at the theme park was killing them, killing them. They just needed some water to drink, and they just had a little drop of something. It'd make all the difference. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you, because it was Moses' fault, right? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children die of thirst? See, when Jesus said, I am thirsty, he was literally dying. The nation of Israel is living by God's grace alone and saying, you're killing us because we're thirsty. Isn't it crazy how this plays out? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. 
Remember when Jesus started doing miracles in his hometown, what the people wanted to do to him? They tried to stone him. And he had to escape. If you read the Gospels when he first started doing that, that's why he said he couldn't do ministry in his hometown because they would stone him like they did the prophets in the past. And here goes Moses. He's just saying, God, these people are so mad at me that, that they want bottled water. They want something to drink, and they're so mad. They've got food to eat, so they're satisfied there. Now they're looking at the next need you need to fill, and they're mad at me, so now they're going to try to stone me because obviously my body carries all the water. When they stone me, they're going to get water out of me, right? They're just mad at him. Then Moses cries out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Then the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Who is Jesus? The rock of our salvation. The rock at Horeb. Strike the rock. And water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah, which mean because the Israelites, excuse me, quarreled and because they tested the Lord. And they said this, is the Lord among us or not? Here's what I want to talk to you about today when we talk about a fulfilled life, because I w I'm going to talk to you specifically if you know Jesus today when you're trying to live this fulfilled life. I'm willing to bet at this moment in the cross and on the cross, when Jesus is saying, I'm thirsty, the people that he trusted the most, the people that followed him the most, were probably wondering if the Lord was with them or not. And when he says, I'm thirsty, he's pointing them back to this story and he's reminding them, hey, you remember when the Israelites said, strike the rock, strike the rock? And when you strike the rock, the water's gonna come out. You remember that? Hey, you remember when I was with the woman at the well and I told her, if you knew who it is you're asking the question, you would see that I will give you rivers of life flowing out of you, that you just need a little bit of water from the well, but what I have is so much greater, so much more. He's pointing them back to that and saying, remember, remember, when I say I'm thirsty, remember this moment in time where God moved, where you got something from God, but it only came from the rock that you could experience water in your life. So today, if you're a Christian, I want to talk to you about how in the world you can live a fulfilled life, because here's the thing. We can know Jesus died to give it to us, but do everything we can but live it. I can tell you in my life that's where I can be. I can tell you all day long the platitudes. I can tell you all day long the scripture. But when it comes to the faith to have it sometimes, I'm just like those Israelites. Saying, God, where's my water? Are you not with me? Why are you making me go through this, God? This doesn't make sense to me. Why in the world would you be beating me down? And, and why in the world would you leave me thirsty like this? Because you said that I would have rivers of, of life, of, of, of water flowing out through me. Why in the world do I feel this way? This is not the fulfilled life you died to give me. Why am I going through this? And it leaves us to question whether the Lord is among us or not. So today I want to talk to you about three things. I'm going to lay all my cards out on the table if you're a Christian. And it's going to go along with the springtime. I was going to have some fertilizer up here, but it's going to be a rough time me getting that on and off. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things, and I'm just going to lay them out there, and I'm going to talk to you about what they're required in your life. I'm going to talk to you about need, feed, and seed. Need, feed, and seed. Sounds great, right? This time of year, that's what you do to your lawn. You need a clean lawn because your HOA is mad. So you feed it some fertilizer and some grass, and you seed it, and you bury those seeds and hope that something comes up. Even if it's weeds, it's green, right? I'm just saying it is what it is, right? That's kind of where we are. So I want to talk to you about living a fulfilled life in Jesus Christ and looking back at him on the cross when he says, I am thirsty. He's pointing back to a story to remind us how to live a fulfilled life. So number one, if you're taking notes, need requires love. Need requires love. Need requires love. In this moment in our life when Moses is talking to the Israelites and he's talking to those people, what can get caught up in our life is this. He's saying to each and every one of us, his love is the only thing that we really need. Like Moses in this story knows that the people are mad. The people have seen God move and all they want is a little sip sip of some water, right? A little something to quench the thirst. A little drop of water is what they will need, which... By the way, God, Jesus tells us in another time that that's what living in hell is like. I don't know if you know that, but they're begging to quench their thirst because they chase the wrong things to quench their thirst. So he's reminding us in this moment. And so the people were searching for something instead of eternal satisfaction, just something that could simply satisfy in the moment. I wonder how many of us are living that life right now. Hey, God, I just need to get through another day. Hey, God, it's just... Uh, 
If you just meet this need, I promise I'll never do that again, right? How many of us have been there or are there right now? I'm guilty of that. We do that. But when Moses does this, he's, what Jesus is showing us is that when we leave our life of sin as a Christian and we enter into his rest, it's not about being filled immediately. It's about being satisfied eternally. And when we see that, that can only come from the love of God. So need requires love. With Jesus on the cross, we can see that his earthly ministry, when he's talking about being thirsty, his entire earthly ministry was filled with love. If you look at Jesus, he never made a trip from point A to point B without getting interrupted. Zero times. Zero times. Zero times was he running late for an appointment that he ever got there on time. Now, it was on his time. But it wasn't on the time that everybody thought it would be. As, when I look back, look at when he was going to heal, heal the, the city official's daughter and the woman who had been bleeding for years. Remember, she stops him in the crowd and touches him, and she's instantly healed. When Jesus is just trying to go off to a mountain to pray, he's tired, he's weak, and all of a sudden the crowds of people show up on him. He has compassion and love upon him, and it says he sees them like sheep without a shepherd. That's when he feeds the 5,000. All of a sudden, when we look back in our life, and Jesus is hearing that his best friend, Lazarus, has just died. Instead of going immediately, he says, I still got some work to do here. There are some people that need to feel my love and feel the love of the Father. I'll get to Lazarus when I need to. And the people said, you're late. And all of a sudden, Lazarus rose up and, and walked again. So in other words, what I see with Jesus' life is it's marked by love. So Christian, this is what I'm getting at with you and me. When we look at need requiring love, I want to ask you, where are you at in your walk with Jesus? Are you needy or needed? Are you needy? Or are you needed? Because the mark of a mature Christian is someone who's needed, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the mark of someone who is a new Christian or the mark of someone who is just trying to figure this thing out to following Jesus when we look at need requiring love is a needy person says, I have to constantly be put back together. It's all about me. When I pray, it'll tell you if you're needy or needed. What do you pray the most about? Do you pray about you? Do you pray about Jesus? If you'll just meet my needs, if you'll just fix me, if you'll just give me what I need, that's what Israel is in this story. They're a needy people. They're still children of God, but they're needy. It's all about filling my needs. I alone need relief. Forget about everybody else. Satisfy the immediate need I have, and then I'll follow you. Then I'll be happy. Now, let's look at the needed person. The needed person is the one that you can always call on. They realize that it's not about them. They realize that whatever they're going through, I wish I could tell you I was perfect at this, y'all. But they realize whatever they're going through, whatever season they're going through, whatever blessing they've been given, is so that they can be a life-springing well that flows forth life and hope to everyone around them. They're a needed person. That's the person you call when all of it's falling apart. That's a needed person. They're not replacing Jesus. They just show you Jesus like never before. A needed person realizes my life is not about me. My life is about being poured out to others. Does it sound like something familiar? Like the cross where Jesus understand that because of love, he poured his life out for others. And because of love, he stood up there and he fulfilled the needs. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, if you're a needed person over a needy person, generosity marks your life. That's what I love about our church. We want to talk about life. We want to talk about being involved with people and meeting them right where they are. And we understand that all of this is great and all of this is awesome, but none of this is for us. It's all for the entire world to find the hope of Jesus. And to remind us of the hope of Jesus when we need to walk through whatever we're walking through in whatever season we're in. So if you're a needed person, that's the mark of a mature Christian. Moses was a needed person at that moment in time. They were willing to stone him (laughs) at that moment in time. And so if I'm looking at my life and I'm looking and saying that need requires love, I promise you if you're a needy person, you just love yourself. And it's all about you. Doesn't mean that you don't know Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, as an early Christian, we all start there. That's what Paul's talking about when he's talking about milk, spiritual milk for us, is we're a needy person. And, and, and it's not that we don't celebrate Jesus, it's just about filling our needs. But eventually, as we follow Jesus and move from the desert of sin and become more like him into the place of rest, we realize that it's not about us, it's actually about the people God's placed around us in our life and the interruptions that he's placed around us in our life and the ones that the divine appointments he's set up in front of all of us. And we're a needed person. And when we do that, We love God and we love others. We talk about that every week at the Vine Church. We're a church that wants to turn the world upside down with the gospel instead of being turned upside down by the world. Well, we're going to do that 
by being needed in how we love God and love others. When I'm a needed person instead of a needy person, I start seeing the world searching for a need to satisfy something that the world will never satisfy. And Moses saw that. He looks at Israel and says, hey, you're just looking for water, and I know that there's something greater here in God delivering us. There's something greater. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm thirsty to remind us, hey, I am thirsty so that you can be satisfied. What I'm thirsting for is actually for you to live the life that I died to give you, for you to live the life that springs up with eternal living water and shows the world hope that nothing in this world can satisfy but Christ and Christ alone and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So Christian, if we're looking at living a fulfilled life, where are we at on the spectrum? If need requires love, are we needy or are we needed? As your pastor today, I'll tell you there are many places I'm pretty needy. And Jesus is working me to be needed. But I will tell you together, we can show the world that we are needed, not by who we are, but because of who he is. And that shows up in how we love God and how we love others. So today, need requires love if you want to live a life that is fulfilled. Number two, seed. Seed requires hope. <clears throat> seed requires hope. Need requires love and seed requires hope. Seed requires hope because, you know, when I plant those seeds in the yards, I hope it grows, right? The things that I plant, I hope grows. Hope can see the potential in things. Hope, hope can look forward and not see the bad in the person, but see the potential of what they can be. Hope can see the betterment of the situation. Hope can see, I had a situation like that this week, and Jesus reminded me of this with, with seed requiring hope. As I'm walking through things, I actually was out and about showing a house and my car battery died. And I said, oh, my car battery's out. Have we all been there? Like, we know that. We got to talk. A couple of people have been there, had car issues. And by God's grace, I had a cold start in my car. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a laugh. And if I chuckle too hard, this might be bad. But I'm going to give you a laugh. When I went to start the car, the horn went crazy when the battery's dead. So any mechanics out there is probably saying that's not his battery. Don't worry about it. It's working now, okay? We got it working now. So uh, the, the horn just stuck on. And so I'm showing these house. And by God's grace, they're awesome people. They knew me. Uh, and I'm just got, I'm in the middle of this neighborhood, and my horn's going crazy, and I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> got the car started, went to go get the battery changed, and, and, and at, there are times in my life when I would have looked at that and been like, God, here we go again. I just needed my car to be okay, Jesus. I'm a needy person. You couldn't have had a battery fall out of the sky. That's $200 I could have spent doing something else, Jesus. Like, you know, that could have been a power bill or, or, or water or whatever that looks like, like whatever it is. But in that moment this week when I saw that seed requires hope, I said, Jesus, thank you. Because I know that I'm about to be out of it for a little while and I may not be able to drive for about a week. And I'm thankful that my battery died now instead of when I needed to go somewhere at home and that battery was dead. And I went to crank my car in the garage and the horn was going everywhere and I probably messed myself or something just trying to go somewhere because I scared, right? Like, thank you. Thank you. And so what I thought about that is, is how when we our need requiring love and how we can laugh and get excited in that moment is our seed requires hope. We have to see the potential of what is to come in this story for where Moses is. Moses is seeing the promise that God's planted in his people to step out of the desert of sin and enter into rest as they go into the promised land. As a matter of fact, what Moses sees is that seed of hope God's put in Israel is actually the hope that all of us get to have by Jesus on the cross and that there's something greater to come. But he sees the potential of something great. But the people and God's people of Israel are so stuck on not having water that somehow they're so thirsty that they had energy to pick up stones and throw it. How many of us get stoned by our own people, Christians? I probably get stoned by more Christians than I do people who don't follow Jesus. And I want to tell you, he didn't die on that cross for us to live that way. As a matter of fact, he died on us to be united. He prayed for us to be in perfect unity before he went to the cross. And we've got to be together as one to show the world hope instead of talking about, well, I don't have this. I don't have no water. My water's not that crystal clear spring water that they got. I got hose water. That ain't enough, right? Like, we get mad about that, don't we? That's not what Jesus died to give us. Instead, he's given us a seed of hope inside of us. And what I love about this story with Jesus on the cross is literally he is that rock in the story. He's the rock that is stricken. He is the rock that overflows life and life-giving water for the people of Israel to have their thirst quenched. 
So I go back to that question, where are you quenching your thirst? Is it in that quick bottle of water or is it in something that's everlasting? You see, as I was looking at this story even more, I thought about this. I said, hope, hope in my life says it's going to be a better day. Hope in my life lives out the best is still yet to come. I had somebody in, and, 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 and they, they were being sincere and I love them as a friend and they were trying to, they were just trying to, to say something great and I, and I totally get it and, and I understand where they were coming from. They said, well, hey, the best is not still yet to come. The best is already here, but tomorrow will be a better day. And I was like, so the, the best is still yet to come, but that's okay. Uh, that being said, hope says the best is still yet to come. Hope says that if it's not over, God's not done. If I've still got breath in my lungs, there's still something better for me. As I walk out of the desert of sin and enter into his rest, there's something greater for me. But the question is, does the world see that? Or do they see us walking around, shoot, ain't got no water. Where are my stones at? You know, I'm looking for my stones. I ain't got no water. This God that I love, I know he died and gave all on the cross and, and he's supposed to give me this fulfilled life. Well, it ain't filled with the money, cars, house, and clothes that I thought I would have. Isn't it crazy how we get there? I've been there. So the question is, if we have, go from needy to needed, we can see the seed of hope that Jesus has planted inside of us. And when I thought about this, and I don't know if any of you have ever, how many of us have ever read this book? It's by Max Licato. I would, I would definitely recommend it if you have kids or if you just need some encouragement. There's a book called The Story of the Acorn. Has anybody ever heard about this? Oh, it's an awesome book. Uh, it's a great book. A lot of times at this moment in time, if you know me, I love children's literature. Uh, I, I could have done the giving tree in this moment, so it's very similar. But when I talk about the seed of hope and this acorn is in a short, <laughs> long story short instead of short story long. Y'all know how I roll. Um, the story of the acorn goes like this. The acorn falls from the tree. It lands on the ground <clears throat> and it's buried and it doesn't grow for a minute. And it gets upset that it's not an orange tree because the orange tree is so sweet and so satisfying and it comes out in the sun and it has really pretty colors. It understands that it's not an evergreen tree that brings people joy at Christmas, so it's not this pine tree that's, that's running around, that's, that's exciting. Uh, and the world tells it, don't you just want to be a pine? Don't you just want to be a, a, an orange tree? And it realizes it's not a banana tree, it's not growing up in this environment, and so it starts getting upset and it thinks, I have no purpose. I'm just a little acorn. What in the world am I here for? But then one day that little acorn grows into a mighty oak. And all of a sudden its branches go out and it drops more acorns and it sees all the little oaks underneath it. And it realizes that through those branches, I gave shade for those other oaks to grow. And maybe my hope and maybe my purpose is to take this little acorn seed that's inside of me and understand that I'm a mighty oak. Like when you look at the oak trees, have you ever thought about that? Like we celebrate that. You go down to Charleston, they have some mighty oaks, right? Those are some big oak trees. And so what this means for each and every one of us is the oak inside the acorn is the miracle and the seed of hope that God has created and planted inside of us. The seed to be exactly who he created us to be. Not what the world tells us to be because that's temporary satisfaction. That's people looking at Jesus on the cross saying, I'm thirsty. He just wants some wine and vinegar. No, 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 no. He's pointing back to God's word. Remember, he told us man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he's saying, hey, I'm the bread of the life. I'm the bread of life. Go back to the word of God. Understand that the thirst that you want quenched will come from that. And so I wonder if we would look at that story of that little acorn and understand that there's a seed of hope inside of us just waiting to grow. But if I look at everything I'm not, it's impossible for me to see the potential of everything Jesus created me to be. And if I can't see who Jesus created me to be, I definitely can't see it in others who he created them to be. That's the difference between a needy person and a needed person as well, as they understand the potential and can see what Jesus has done and can see what Jesus wants to do in them. When I look at Jesus on the cross, I once again am reminded that seed of hope. Because what does a seed have to do to grow? It's got to die, right? I don't know if you remember that from class. But once that seed's in the, in the ground, it dies and gives force to new life. And I look at that cross and I see the seed of hope that we have to share with the world. And I wonder, that the, does the world see that seed of hope in me? Or do they just hear me talk about everything I lack? They hear me talk about the water that I don't have to drink. 
See, Jesus' thirst was for us to live that fulfilled life that springs up hope, that shows that seed of hope and shows that there is a better day, that the best is still yet to come, that, that he died to give us a life and, and, and live it to the full, that, that it wasn't about us just being satisfied on this earth. It was about us having eternal satisfaction. And so, Christian, today, will you understand that the need that people have in their life and the need that you have in your life requires the love of God. Will you see the seed that you have in your life requires hope. You've got to have hope that better days are to come. And the last thing that I have to share with you is feed requires faith. We're going to spend some, some more time on this. Feed requires faith. Need requires love. Seed requires hope. Feed requires faith. You see, Moses heard from God what he could do to get water from the rock, and God said, strike it. What if Moses never struck the rock? What if Jesus has commanded you and called you to take a next step in faith, to take, you a, to take a next step to do the thing he created you to do, but you're fearful to do it, or you're holding back from doing it because it's not what you thought it would be? I wonder today if you would understand that to feed that seed inside of you, you've got to have faith. Moses struck the rock and the water flowed. Little did he know that Jesus on the cross and his next to last word on the cross is going to point back to Moses doing this exact same thing, listening to Jesus doing what he says. Like it said, Jesus said, I'm here to do the will of my father, right? Moses did the will of the father right here and he, he literally struck the rock. Jesus, he knew that if he did the will of the father, he would go to the cross. And I don't remember if you know this or I don't know if we've talked about it, but Paul talks about it this way. He says, he goes for joy to the cross. If I hear somebody say I'm thirsty, I don't think they're joyful, do you? <laughs> Usually they're throwing a temper tantrum. But instead, Jesus with intentionality is saying, hey, you've got to have faith that I am who I say I am. To remind us of, of this feed requiring faith. If you remember when Peter is restored, after Jesus uh, dies, rises again, and he meets him on the seashore, they're having, uh, if Chick-fil-A had fish, whatever it would be, I guess fish filet is what it would be called, whatever it is, uh, Long John Silvers of the day, I guess is what it is. Uh, they, they had fish on the seashore, and, and, and Jesus looks at Peter, and he restores him and says, do you love me? Need requires love. Peter gets angry, he gets upset, and he's, he's so shameful, he's so overcome, but I want you to remember what Jesus said to him. What is it he said? Feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? God, you know I do. I would, I would die for you. You know I do. Feed my sheep. He's reminding him to feed with faith. He asks him again, do you love me? So I want to ask you today, are you feeding that seed of hope with faith, or are you just bitter because God's called you to take a step and you're unwilling to take it? You see, it's great for me to have the seed of hope inside of me and see the possibility of what God created you and I to be. Faith says I'm involved in the reality of taking the next step. I've shared this story before, uh, and, and I'm going to do my best not to butcher it, but the story of the bamboo is what I was reminded of in this moment in time. And how it goes is, you know, you bury the bamboo, and, and once you bury it underground, what happens is it sit dormant for, for, for years and years, and, and you water it, you, you sing to it, you do your little thing, you know, you get it all excited. You get all excited, and you just hope that this bamboo is going to go. And all of a sudden, somewhere between year five and six, about year seven, what happens is this bamboo, all of a sudden, overnight, it grows three feet. You've been feeding it. You've been singing it. You've been taking next steps. You've been preparing it and taking care of it like it's been there all along. And it shoots up three feet overnight. And believe it or not, within six months, it grows to 80 feet tall in that seventh year. But it had to keep being fed. And so if I really want to see and show the world the love of Jesus Christ, and I want to show them the hope that is only found in him, I've got to feed my faith by being constantly filled with the word of God. I can't walk around in my life and talk about platitudes and not take next steps in doing it. I can't walk around in my life and talk to people about how great Jesus is and then in the next moment be... That's crappy, right? Would anybody want that? I wouldn't. What Jesus is reminding us on the cross when he's talking about living that fulfilled life and he's saying, I'm thirsty, is he's saying, look back to when I set my people free. When I set you free from the sin in your life and I gave you a place to enter into rest and instead do you see me as the water 
which this is alluding to him not being here yet, the water of life that will satisfy you eternally? Or do you walk around ready to stone somebody because they don't give you what you want? Most of the time, Christians in our walk, that's what ends up happening. We turn our back on Jesus because he didn't give us what, he, what we wanted. And I just want to remind you today to live this life that is fulfilled. We've got to keep filling ourselves with the word of God and knowing that there is hope there is something great to come, that there is better days ahead, that this fulfilled life is something that the world can want to be a part of. You know, when we live a life that is fulfilled, it's crazy how people just want to be a part of it, right? It's crazy how people want to be a part of it. But when we don't, it's hard how people don't want to. And so when I talk about Jesus to my friends and family, when I invite people to church, when I invite them to be a part of what he's doing here at the Vine, I have to be reminded myself of, Hey, are you showing them Jesus like they should? Like, are you showing them Jesus like the first time you saw him for who he was? Or are you just showing them Jesus who will come through eventually? Who will make a way sometime? Yeah, he's, he's got me this house, but I wanted an extra bedroom in it. I wanted an extra car. I wanted an extra yard. Yeah, he got one dog, but I wanted two. I wanted seven dogs. I wanted cats, dogs, and llamas. You know, he left the llama out. I mean, but he's God. He saved all. Christian, you know what that is, is the world. And I'm guilty of living that life just as much as all of us. But Jesus died on the cross and said, I am thirsty to remind us that any time we're thirsty, if we'll look to the cross, he'll quench that thirst because what he will give us will outweigh anything this world could ever give us. Anything this world would ever show us. Anything this world could ever even try to temporarily satisfy. And when we live a life like that, will we show the world that need, feed, and seed is really living a life of faith, hope, and love? All of a sudden, we'll see the lives around us change. We'll see the communities around us change. And we'll see the people around us change because they'll see Jesus like never before because their needs will be satisfied only by him. They'll take next steps and they'll see the seeds of hope inside of them. They'll take next steps to be all that he created them to be and they will feed themselves on the word of God. It won't matter that there's one person preaching the Bible to them. They'll dive into their Bible every day. Beginning of today, I got to hang out a little bit as we were walking through and running through the service and I got to share this story uh, this week. So uh, I know this person isn't watching, but if you are awesome, I know that the Spirit is speaking to you. So uh, through all this health madness that I've walked through, I got led to a surgeon uh, in the community who has, uh, who has done a couple of different surgeries for my family, uh, and, and he will be doing my surgery. And uh, we got to talking. He's, he's, a, he's a Christ follower. We got to talking, and he was letting me know about some friends of a different religion. Uh, and he said, man, I, I just love them right where they are, and I just want to be Jesus to them the best way I can. And and, you know, it's not my job to convert them. The spirit will move when it's supposed to. But if you would, please pray for this person. Uh, just be praying for me and pray for them that I live this fulfilled life, that I be Jesus to them in any way that I can be. And uh, maybe one day I'd love to introduce you to them. You say you're a pastor and a realtor, you know. Uh, you, I just want to introduce you to them. I said, okay, that would be awesome. I, I've been praying for that. And believe it or not, this week I had a follow-up appointment. My appointment got changed. Time slot, uh, they said, hey, we want you to get you in here earlier. We want to get you in here earlier. We want to get you right when we open. Uh, we want to take care of you and get you there because we know your next step. You may not know it yet, but I bet somebody's telling you what it was, and I knew the Holy Spirit was like, yep, you're having surgery. Uh, so I knew that I was having surgery, so I'm going to be filling out paperwork, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and who do you think sitting in the waiting room? That person that I'd been praying for, for that surgeon that he asked me to pray for. And he sits there and we talk for about 30 minutes. And I want you to know, there was a Bible sitting in that waiting room. And that man was reading that Bible when I walked back to my appointment. And an hour later, he was still in that Bible reading the Gospel of John. And you want to talk about living a fulfilled life. As in that moment, as I was getting ready for today, and in that moment, as I was talking about living a fulfilled life, I got to see Jesus move like never before. And in another, another time in my life, I would have told you, God, here we go. I got to wait for another stinking appointment. Now that I moved my appointment, what in the world is going on? I would have been angry and mad sitting in that doctor's office. But instead, I got to see that need was filled with love. I got to look at a different lens and see that this person was actually searching. And I saw him reading the Bible and I said, God, remind me what it was like to get in my Bible like that again. 
just read it like it's the first time I've ever seen it. Like it's something new that can give hope like never before. Remind me to live a life like that because that's what he's going to see. And that's how the spirit is going to move in him. And believe it or not, this religion I've actually had training with and got to talk to this person about being a follower of Jesus and, and how I could see it in this moment. And I could see the gears turning, but I may never know the end of the story. But in that moment, Jesus was saying, hey, Tyler, I was thirsty. and I'm showing you that your life matters. Will you just look at people through the lens of love that I've given you? Will you just see the hope that there is potential in every circumstance, every season, and every opportunity, even when it seems like it's the hardest? And will you just have the faith to believe that I'm going to come through and do what I said I was going to do? Christian, if we live that life, man, man, the difference we can make. That's the fulfilled life that Jesus died on the cross to give us. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 6, this, as I got to talk with that man, I was reminded of this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? They will be filled. What do you thirst for? Do you thirst for just a drink of water? <laughs> just a piece of food? Just gas in the tank? Lights on at the house? House payment to be made? Do you thirst for righteousness? Do you thirst for a life that Jesus died to give you? Because I will promise you, friend, once you've met Jesus, no matter what you're going through, you're going to know you're not walking it alone. You're going to find hope in the midst of it. You're going to feel love like you've never thought you would feel before, and you're going to see your faith grow. And all of a sudden, that four-letter word that is rest won't be as hard to take working on me. Trust me, it won't be as hard to take. So today, what do you hunger and thirst for? Because when I look at Exodus 17, I know the only way that I could ever be satisfied is to go to the rock. And when I look at the cross, I see the rock of my salvation doing what I could never do, living a life that I couldn't live, dying the death that I deserved on that cross, but loving me enough not to stay dead, but rise again on the third day so that I could have a full life. So today, Christian, let's live a life filled with faith, hope, and love. Let's see the needs of those around us. Let's show them the hope that only Jesus can give. And man, oh man, let's continue to feed them with our faith. Today, maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Today, I talked a lot to people who know who Jesus is, and maybe we were reminded today who he created us to be, and we were reminded today the life that he's called us to live, and maybe we've been in a funk. Hey, yo, maybe we've been in a funk, and we're trying to get out of it. And we're getting reminded today of that. But maybe today you're trying to search throughout the entire world for something to fill you've you've gone through job after job and it's never satisfying enough you've gone through you've gone through chasing maybe drugs or alcohol or relationships or or, or maybe you've you, you've gone through this thing of chasing finances you've gone through this thing of chasing everything that this world has to offer and I tell you what you've ate of the world and the best of it and you're still dry you're still coming up empty you keep seeing like like you're in the same place you were five years ago and it's like a cycle that keeps going over and over and over again. And friend, I just want to ask you today, have you ever given your life to the rock? Have you ever given your life to Jesus? Have you ever trusted him as your Lord and Savior? Because here's the thing, it's not about being perfect, it's not about cleaning yourself up or going through a 12-step program or, or doing all these great things to have a relationship with him. It's literally simply receiving him. It's literally drinking from the rock and saying he is what he says he is. Like he died on the cross for your sin. He loved you enough not to stay dead and that he lived a perfect life so that you don't have to. As a matter of fact, it said at the beginning of this, he said, knowing that all of the scripture would be fulfilled, knowing that the work was finished, he came and said, I am thirsty. So today, Hey, I wonder how thirsty you are. Will you fill that thirst with something this world has to offer that will satisfy you for a week, satisfy you for a month, satisfy you for a few years, or do you want something greater that will satisfy you eternally? When I look back and I see what Jesus is telling us about this in John 7, verse 37 through 38, he shows us exactly how we can have a relationship with him. And he says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, he's talking about the festival of the tabernacles, where people who were Jewish and non-Jewish could come together to the temple and celebrate. Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow through them. So today, all you got to do is believe. It's that simple. 
We're going to say a prayer in a minute. It's not the words of this prayer that gets you saved. It's not the words of this prayer that, that makes you have a life. They're just words. It's faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And so, friend, as we're about to say this prayer out loud as a family, I just want to ask you, have you ever given your life to Jesus? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you today to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe that you lived the life I couldn't live, <clears throat> died the death I deserved on the cross, but loved me enough not to stay dead, but rose again on the third day so that I may have a fulfilled life. Come take over my life, Lord. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. And wherever you are right now, whether you're watching online, you're in the coffee shop in the middle of the week, whatever it is you're doing, if it's the first time that you can say that you have given your life to Jesus, that you have gone to the rock and understand that Jesus is the rock of your salvation. Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy the thirst that you have. Jesus is the only thing that can fill the hunger that you have, that no matter what dry place you're in, he is the only one that can give you life. If you can say for the first time that is you, I'm about to count to three and I'm gonna ask you to have some faith with me. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and do something bold. And it's not so that I can single you out. It's so that you can know that you have a family that's walking with you step by step, whatever you're walking through. So one, two, three. If that's you in this house or if that's you online, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand online. There's going to be a hand that you can click that is raised that can show you who that can, that can click on and we can get in touch with you and show you even more what it is to follow Jesus and even more what it is to have this fulfilled life. So if that's you and you're watching online, I'm going to ask you to comment on Facebook or let us know at hello at divine.tv because we want to celebrate for you. And everyone else that's in the house, I'm about to pray and I'm going to ask you to stand up for worship after that. And I'm just going to pray that we would worship like the first time we saw Jesus is who he says he is. I pray that we wouldn't worry about the water that's missing in our place of rest, that we see that the water has been there in our Savior all along. So dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to listen to you and do what you say. Thank you for the faith that you've given us to follow you. Jesus, this day is all about you. It's not about us. So right now, as we get to step into this moment, I pray more than anything that we would we would just seek you, that we would live with a lens of faith, hope, and love, that we would, we would see the needs that this world is searching for and know that you are the only one who can meet them, that, that we would see your hope in everyone around us because all of us are made in your image, God. And, and Jesus, you died on the cross so that all may be saved, not just some. Let us live that out. And Jesus, I also pray today that we would feed our life with faith that we would have faith in you more and more, that we would grow in steps of faith with you and that we wouldn't be afraid to take the step that you've called us to take, Jesus, but that, that we would get to just show everyone you and say, hey man, I'm not where I wanna be, but I'm certainly not where I used to be and it's only because of Christ in me. So today, Jesus, as we are reminded who we are in you, I pray like never before we would worship like the first time. We love you, Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Child. 
All right, all right. You know how we do it every week here at the end. I know today was a little challenging. A day was a little hopefully eye-opening. But today I pray that no matter what we do, we go to the rock. We know the rock of our salvation. I pray that we'd be reminded that we are a child of God and we'd be reminded that he split the sea. Remember, we walked through on dry land that we are his children. And I pray that today we would know that we have family with us. So as everybody, you're gonna see some folks probably crossing over, putting arms on each other. I just want you to know we at the Vine Church are family and we're thankful that you have allowed us into your space and into your time to be a part of family today. I want you to know that we love you and we thank you for that. And so today I pray Christians that we would just go out and live this week being the child of God he created us to be. And it's crazy how when we live that fulfilled life, man, you get to see Jesus do things like you never thought before. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time together today. I pray that your spirit would move as only it can. We know that your word does not return void, but today, Jesus, whatever it is you challenged us to do, whether whether we're struggling with being needy versus needed, and, and, and that's just a matter of what we love or who we love the most, Jesus, where we're struggling with hope and seeing the seeds of hope that, that you've planted inside of us, that, that we would see the potential that there is a better day ahead, that the best is still yet to come. I pray that we would live that out. And Jesus, I pray that you would remind us to feed ourselves with faith, with faith, with the word of God. You promised us that none of us could live on bread alone, but only by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus, I pray that we would feed the faith inside of us, that we would boldly take next steps and we would boldly continue to step into being exactly who you created us to be. Let us be like that little acorn that understands the miracle and seed of hope inside of us. Let us be like that bamboo shoot that's constantly being fed in the world excuse me, in the word, not the world. And so that we can sprout up overnight and others can see mighty things that you were done. And Jesus, let us always fill our needs with your love. Let us turn this world upside down with the gospel of hope that only you can bring. Instead of being turned upside down by the world, Jesus, let us love God and love others like never before. Remind us what it was like to be there the first time. Remind us how far you brought us out of the desert of sin and into this place of rest. Remind us, Jesus, today that you are the rock. We love you, Lord. We can't believe that we get to do this. Thank you for coming and living a life that we couldn't live, dying a death we deserved and rising again on the third day. And here at the end, Lord, we always like to have a laugh and I know that you speak to me through the Holy Spirit and laughter. So thank you for the shoulder workout that I'm giving everyone right now. We love you, Lord. It's your name we pray, amen. Hey, come hang out with us next week as we take communion. Maybe you've never taken communion or you don't know what it's about. Come hang out with us next week as we talk about seven cries from the cross, finished and celebrate communion together. Have an awesome week.